This podcast is sponsored by GoGo, the leader in in-flight connectivity and wireless entertainment. Our superior technologies, best-in-class service, and global reach help planes fly smarter. Our partners perform better, and their passengers travel happier. Learn more at gogoair.com forward slash airline. If you've been listening to the Airline Weekly Lounge for very long, you probably noticed we love a good turnaround story. Love. Well, it is almost Valentine's Day. Right. And that always brings out our romantic side. But yes, we do love a turnaround story. And one may be brewing in Singapore, as Singapore Airlines posted its best fourth quarter since 2010. In Q4, the airline posted a 7% operating margin, much healthier than the 4% it posted in the same quarter the year before. And this success came despite revenue headwinds, no shortage of low-cost carrier competition, and even the Paris attacks denting its numbers. So what's happening? Well, cheap fuel prices have, of course, been a cure-all. But does the story end there, or is Singapore really turning things around? I'm Jason Cottrell, Vice President of Airline Weekly. And I'm Seth Kaplan, Managing Partner of Airline Weekly. We're going to start with the Singapore question. We're also going to talk about Richard Anderson's retirement, Jet Airways' resurgence, trouble on the Korean Peninsula, and WestJet's triumph over adversity. And we'll talk about what Ryanair is doing wrong. Spoiler alert, not much. Come, spend some time with us in the Airline Weekly Lounge. Thanks for joining us. So getting back to the Singapore story, again, we're talking about a 7% operating margin in calendar Q4 versus a 4% operating margin in the same quarter the year before. That's a significant difference, but not all that big of a difference, especially when you factor in cheap fuel. So how can we say that Singapore is doing better, that this isn't just a windfall from low fuel prices? Well, it's mostly a windfall from low fuel prices. Uh, But uh, first of all, one thing, uh, uh, we talk about a, a turnaround story. And it is one because their margins had slipped in recent years, you know, an airline that historically was very profitable among the world's more successful airlines and then ha- has just had some weak years recently. But I mean, certainly not a company that was you know, insolvent. I mean, it's, it's not a, a, a rags to riches story, just an airline that had been had been slipping and, and had been profitable, but only barely so in recent years. And now, yes as you said, posted a rather nice quarter. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the fuel price windfall was was the biggest thing, but not the only thing. Uh, Singapore Airlines benefiting also from uh, some some benign conditions in, in its neighborhood. You know, Malaysia Airlines, uh, partly because of everything that befell it, for an airline that wasn't doing all that well to begin with, uh, ha- has really been slashing capacity. And, and they compete uh, for a lot of the same connecting traffic a- a- as Singapore Airlines. So that's very helpful. Uh, you know, and, and at Singapore Airlines itself, its most troubled flying unit, Scoot, alongside Tiger Air, which it of which it now is a majority owner, you know, those are doing better too. Of course, that's partly a fuel story as well. Uh, so maybe you could say a distinction without a difference there. But yeah, uh, certainly some 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 things in the neighborhood going well, some things internally going well, and yes, much cheaper fuel. I'm glad you brought up Scoot. Uh, They are enjoying their best quarter ever, and that came as a surprise to me because they hadn't been doing so well. And uh, low-cost long haul is just generally that difficult. It is. What's happening. Yeah, yeah, it is. And and, uh, so you you always kind of take note when one of those does well. I mean, we've, we've talked about this in the past. Uh, all the reasons why that model is so difficult, low cost long haul, as well as just sort of low cost units of, uh, of, of, a, of a legacy airline company. Uh, and Scoot is, is both of those things. And uh, yeah, now, now breaking even, uh, now, to be clear, it, it, it still lags the company's overall margins. It's not the reason the company's making money, uh, but it's no longer it's no longer dragging it down to the extent that it once did. Uh, you know, that's largely a fuel story, uh, you know. Fuel prices, when they are cheap, disproportionately help long haul flying. Uh, And that's because, uh, well, again, we mentioned this in the past, but long story short, you know, fuel, well, to state the obvious, but it's important, you know, fuel costs matter when you're in the air. And so with short haul operations, you know, a lot of the efficiencies come on the ground. You turn the plane around more quickly, have a productive workforce, all those sorts of things on the ground. Uh, Whereas once you're in the air, your your main costs are your aircraft costs and, and fuel. And uh, so when fuel costs drop to the degree they have now, that, that's going to disproportionately help a long haul unit and, and scoot, as you said, 
it is a low cost long haul unit. Okay, going forward, what's the bullish case for Singapore Airlines? Well, some more of the same, just just sort of uh, you know other airlines in in the neighborhood acting more disciplined when it comes to capacity adjustments. Singapore Airlines itself is is doing some things well, uh, including things that it has avoided in the past. And, and you know, just just to to name two of them, joint ventures. You know, this is something it hasn't done as much of as other airlines, but. Uh, but that's been changing in recent years, and now it's about to enter one with Lufthansa. It's a big deal, and it's one of those airlines that, for a long time, probably avoided it because of concerns over, uh, you know, perhaps diluting its brand, uh, you know, selling tickets where somebody ends up flying on a different airline that doesn't have the same kind of product it does. But uh, you know, now they've seen the wisdom, and look, those just tend to work very well for all the airlines that do that. So that's a bullish case. Another thing that where it was kind of a little bit late to the party was premium economy. That's something that's worked well for a lot of long haul airlines around the world uh, and uh, single airlines had not done that. Uh, really, the U.S. carriers are the, uh, have long been the other major exception in the world. And so Singapore Airlines is adopting premium economy and doing so, by the way, with the benefit of, in this case, being sort of having the last mover advantage, being able to learn what has and has not worked around the world. Uh, they have a product that, I mean, you know, I haven't uh, seen it in person yet, but it looks very nice. And uh, if, if their experiences are similar to those of many other airlines that have tried that, uh, every reason to think that that too will be uh, will be helpful for them, particularly on some of those very long stage lengths that they fly. Okay. Clearly, I've been watching too much of the Bloomberg channel because my next question is, uh, what would the bearish case be? <laughs> yeah, well, um, just the fact that, uh, you know, that they are still in a neighborhood that's that's very competitive. Uh, you know, lots and lots of airlines that, uh, you know, for all the capacity discipline that a place like Malaysia Air Airlines might be showing right now, uh, generally capacity growth has been outstripping demand growth in, in, in recent years. And so, uh, you know, if fuel prices were to tick up just a bit, you could very easily get back to a point where unit revenues are falling and unit costs are rising. And, and that would, of course, lead to uh, margin contraction for for uh, Singapore Airlines. Uh, on, on the other hand, by the way, you know one other beneficial thing. Um, it, now it, it's bad news right now, but you know they were rather heavily hedged, so they've they've been not getting the full benefit of falling fuel prices. That's bad uh, in the here and now, but at some point uh, those bad hedges wear off, and, and that would uh, should be a case going forward for a little bit more bullishness. They haven't gotten the full benefit of falling fuel prices, but uh, of course they have to hope that. The spot prices do continue trending downward or at least plateau uh, to be able to get that benefit. All right, let's stay in Asia, but move well north. Troubles at Korean Air and Asiana have continued. Korean Air posted a 5% operating margin in the fourth quarter, while Asiana posted a 1% margin. And one development from outside Korea last week could make things even worse. It could. Uh, talking here about, for the moment, just a very, very modest opening of Taiwan to transit traffic between mainland China and the rest of the world. So, you know, we're talking six freedom traffic, as it's known, you know, people connecting in one country between two other countries. Uh, as I think most people know, there's been a lot of liberalization in recent years of cross strait traffic, uh, traffic across the, the Taiwan Strait, where, um, you know, you have all kinds of nonstop flights between mainland China and Taiwan. Prior, you know, people had to connect in Hong Kong, for example, to, to get between those two countries. So you have all these nonstop options now. But up until now, what you still could not do is transit Taiwan uh, on your way from mainland China to somewhere else in the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, China Airlines and EVA Airways, for example, could not sell tickets uh, from, you know, Beijing connecting in Taipei to Los Angeles or somewhere like that. Uh, that, in a very small way, is now changing. Now, the example I just gave, absolutely not. Not between the biggest cities. But China is now going to let people from a few smaller cities, kind of as, as a trial, begin transiting uh, Taiwan. And so, you know, the, the Sixth Freedom Camel kind of has his nose under the tent here. And, and if this keeps going, all of a sudden, Taipei, in particular, you know, into a lesser degree other cities in Taiwan, could compete. For that traffic, which Korea for a long time kind of had, well, not all to itself, but uh, it was very, very well positioned to carry. So between all the new airport capacity in Japan and all the new nonstop flights from China just overflying all the other hubs, and now the, the prospect of Taiwan uh, competing for some of those connections, not good news uh, for, for, uh, for Korea's airlines. 
Well, we've got good news coming out of India, where the economy is doing pretty well. Jet Airways chalked up a 9% operating margin in the fourth quarter. That's 9% better than the year before. That's a great improvement, but the quarter wasn't as great as SpiceJet and Indigo's. So how much of this is Jet's doing, and how much of it is simply that India is a lucky place to be right now? Yeah, India relative uh, to, to at least it's very difficult own history uh, doing pretty well. It's not mistaken for a stable market, you know, where everybody is assured profitability for a long time. But uh, no, these airlines are all certainly doing well. Yeah, it, no, it's 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 more than just the rising tide. Now, Spice Jet's improvement was the most dramatic. But we're talking about an airline that was, you know, bankrupt and, and on the verge of liquidation, what just just about a year ago. But Jet Airways, if you look at it, for example, its improvement in the quarter you just described, uh, the calendar fourth quarter of 2015, compared to the same period a year earlier, was actually somewhat better, a larger improvement than what Indigo for example, experience that Indigo had already been doing rather well. So that's the point. It started from a much better place. Uh, but yeah, Jet Airways uh, uh, advanced considerably, even relative to the fact that among, you know, certainly among the, you know, the brick economies and, and emerging economies in general, India has been doing rather well tied to, you know, it's rather strong currency and, and, and some of the other things that, that have been going well. And not only, of course, to let's say, smart policy making or anything in the country. And Jet has moved to a little more domestic flying, which I imagine is a good thing, you know, to be further exposed to India, and not so much to international markets. Is that the case? Yeah, it, it, uh, it is, you know, very much the same way that that's, well, in the U.S., for example, domestic flying uh, is, is the thing to do right now. And airlines that do more of that, you know, broadly speaking, are, are doing disproportionately well. So uh, so sure, you know, that 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 has has made sense to to refocus. They're kind of an irony because India's airlines have fought so hard for the right to fly internationally. I mean, Jet's able to. But, you know, there's the 520 rule where, you know, until you have five years of experience flying and 20 aircraft, you can't fly abroad. So, you know, it's, it's considered a privilege. But. You know, but at the moment, domestic, despite a lot of new competition, is uh, is to a large degree the uh, the the place to be right now. Uh, and, and, and that, as I said, despite having really two new airlines, you know, Vistara, backed by an airline we were just talking about a little while ago, Singapore Airlines, and Air Asia, India. By the way, both of those have had their own uh, teething problems. You know, nonetheless, that's capacity in the marketplace and competition for the Indian airlines. But yeah, they're they're finding that in some cases they'd rather compete against that than against some of the other threats abroad. Okay, it's earnings season, so we got to keep moving. We're going to Europe next. Ryanair achieved a 9% operating margin in the fourth quarter. That's great for the off-peak quarter. Uh, in this week's issue, we listed a lot of things that are working at Ryanair. Is anything not working? Well, uh, they're very heavily hedged in the wrong direction. Um, and so, you know, that's prevented them from enjoying the fuel, full benefit of, of uh Falling fuel prices. It's, it's funny. They years ago, you know, when fuel was rising in price, uh, the, of course, it peaked back in 2008. The equity analysts were on their back about why weren't they more heavily hedged? You know, and at the time, it seemed like hedging was almost was almost equivalent to saving money. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's because if, had you hedged, you know, you you uh, for several years there almost certainly uh, paid less for fuel than had you not hedged. And you know, people started to forget that it. It can cut both ways and, and uh, you know, fuel can fall in price and you can be on the hook for bad hedges. And Ryanair, I mean, gosh, I haven't done all the math. Over the past several years, it seems like they probably would have been better off not being hedged at all. Although they did point out that because um, they have such a good credit rating, they do hedge on, on much better terms than other airlines. So, you know, Ryanair being heavily hedged isn't the same thing as, I don't know, Alitalia being being heavily hedged. Uh, it, you know, it, it does get a better deal on its hedge contracts. Okay, moving to North America, Canada's WestJet overcame what might have been a challenging quarter with some nice profits. Uh, they're facing all sorts of headwinds, including a weak currency, but they managed a 12% operating margin. How much of it had to do with their extra legroom plus product? Well, you know, that's helpful. I, I mean, you know, certainly we've, we've seen it that airlines, as they unbundle the product and instead of just sort of giving lots of legroom to everybody, you know, give it to the people who value it and charge them for it, uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, you know, to be clear, I mean, this is an airline that, that, uh, that, that, that is under pressure. Uh, you mentioned the 12% margin. Uh, impressive, you know, relative to everything that's happening. But still, uh, WestJet, one of the few airlines around the world whose margins uh, have slipped despite the falling fuel prices. They 
you know, of course, have to at some point uh, stem the unit revenue declines that they've been experiencing, but they certainly get a lot of credit for for doing as well as they have been doing in in the uh, in the face of all that. And they're certainly a victim of low oil prices. Um, it sounds like they're dealing with a revenue crunch in Alberta, similar to what United is dealing with in Houston. Yeah, and the, the difference being that Alberta is just a much bigger part of, of WestJet's business than Houston is of United's overall business. Uh, you know, which is why an airline like United could still expand its margins year over year, whereas WestJet could not. Uh, so yeah, it's. Yeah, if somebody not paying close attention could say, wait a second, that sounds like a contradiction in terms, you know, low oil prices being bad for an airline. So, uh, yeah, WestJet, as I said, one of the, the only ones in the world whose margins have slipped. Uh, and that's because the negative revenue impact of cheap oil in its core markets uh, is, is just greater than the basically than the, than the fuel savings. Uh, you know, it's now rebalancing its network, shifting a lot of capacity out of Alberta, you know, that's Calgary, Edmonton, and, and to uh, you know, coastal markets, British Columbia, and 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 east uh, places like Toronto. And what's interesting, by the way, is that you know I, I I think it's tempting to think of WestJet for people who are familiar with it as a carrier whose name WestJet is kind of quaint. Uh, you know, its its headquarters city, yes, is Calgary. It, it launched as an airline that was focused more on Western Canada, but we think of it kind of as now this pan Canadian airline, which it is. But up until not long ago, you know, Calgary was still and and. This is just now changing. Calgary is its its busiest base. Uh, so an airline that, yes, although it flies to all the big markets, still more focused on Western Canada uh, than in the East. But this is now changing. L- looking uh, at you know, DO schedules going forward, it, it, I think 2016 is going to be the first year where Toronto will, by pretty much any measure, be the bigger base for WestJet. So they've, uh, they're doing what they can to, to change their exposure, but hard to have as big a percentage of your network impacted in as big a way as WestJet's has been and not see your profits slip. And indeed, that's what's been happening there. Okay. We've talked about Delta quite a bit lately, uh, but they continue to drive the news with their CEO, Richard Anderson, announcing his retirement last week. His legacy is indisputable and has been well covered elsewhere. So we won't gush too much here, uh, but you, uh, but you, being the author of a book about Delta, you you are a keen observer, Seth. Uh, when you look at the other airline leaders in history, say Gordon Berthune, Bob Crandall, Herb Kelleher, I imagine it's easy to come up with similarities among all of them. But what would you say was Anderson's unique characteristic? I would say his adaptability. Uh, you know, he had uh, in the past, of course, run Northwest Airlines, which was a very different airline from Delta. You know, an airline that 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 typically led the industry, you know, in terms of profits did very well until it, it ultimately had cost problems and went into bankruptcy and so forth. But um with a rather successful history, we think of all the others that, that aren't even around anymore. You know, Northwest was a survivor of the deregulation era, very much so, and and uh, and often a leader. An airline that was a vicious competitor, but whose but whose customers and employees sometimes felt that that they were uh, treated a little viciously too. Uh, you know, Delta kind of the opposite. Delta, an airline with uh, you know, with a rather good labor relations history, whose customers were generally rather happy over the years. I mean, although you know, sort of in the in the years surrounding bankruptcy that had changed, but that was maybe at times too nice to its competitors. Delta under Anderson really was, uh, has been the, the, the best of both worlds. Uh, you know, it's something that companies always say when they merge that they're going to take the best of, of both companies, but they don't always achieve it. And Delta, when you look at it, yeah, it competes as viciously as as Northwest ever did. And it's been well noted that you know, Anderson, of course, not one to, to pull verbal punches either. In, in ways that have not always competitors, but but uh, you know some of the, his own partners and suppliers and so forth. But you know a very vicious competitor, and yet an airline that has uh, very happy customers and employees in general. Uh, you know at least relative to most of its peers. And so uh, that's the probably the most impressive trait that he could show up at Delta. You know instead of just thinking that Northwest had it all right and, and sort of. God, I hate to use the cliche, but, you know, the, throw the baby out the bathwater and, and uh, you know, not worry about the things that were going well at Delta already, the labor relations and so forth, really threaded the needle. Oh, God, I'm, I'm just full of uh, bad cliches, aren't I here? But uh, in terms of uh, keeping what was working there already, what had historically been working, but then taking the stuff from Northwest, 
Uh, and it not not only the vicious competitive spirit, but you know the Northwest was uh, was always very good with technology and some other things. Yeah, and just 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 really um, taking the best of both worlds and turning both of those airlines into the most profitable airline in the world in terms of net profits. Uh, you know, certainly uh, for the past couple of years now, depending on how you measure it, uh, you know, American a, a bit more so last year, but quite a legacy. And uh, absolutely, as you said, someone who's now in, in that pantheon with Kelleher, uh, Crandall, Bethune, and uh, certainly going out on top. No question about that. It's Valentine's Day, so uh, cliches are to be expected. <laughs> Uh, as you mentioned, he's leaving on a high note uh, as the airline just posted its best profit ever. Do you think the timing has anything to do with that? Well, I mean, the timing is good, certainly, but uh, he's, he's been on the job almost a decade. That's a long time to, uh, to, to run a company like that. So just as almost the longest tenured uh, CEO, gosh, I guess uh, Parker has been at the job longer, going back to his, his uh, America West days. Anderson has been a CEO the whole time, but of course took a break to to run uh, United Healthcare. But uh, yeah, it's just a long time to to, to run one company. Uh, things are going well. He, uh, uh, you know, I guess Delta's board felt that Ed Bastian's ready, uh, and, and so so sure, why not? It, it's uh, it's no shock, by the way, when people were talking about that you know that this was was going to happen sooner or later, and um, and yeah, no reason to think things are going to take a turn for the worse. But why not go out at a, at a moment like this? All right. Taking a cue from Mr. Anderson, let's also try to leave on a high note. <laughs> Seth, thanks for being here. Don't forget to buy Seth's book, Glory, Lost and Found, How Delta Climbed from Despair to Dominance in the Post-9-11 Era. Search Delta Book at your favorite online bookseller. You will not regret it. Until next week, thanks for stopping by the Airline Weekly Lounge. Do you think Richard Anderson will talk much about our retirement? <laughs> 